we've been taken for a ride by all these elected progressives. And it's fascinating to me watching them pretend like they are these radical revolutionaries who are leading this movement to completely overthrow the democratic establishment by force. While at the same time, they're pushing the same kind of weak sauce incrementalism that we saw from Barack Obama. And the people who are still defending them, they even sound like all of the ignorant ass normie Democrats who would come out and defend Barack Obama for eight years of right wing policies and no major wins for the left. Of course, Bernie and AOC had to go along with the horrendous right wing corporatist policies of the the Democratic and Republican establishment. They were outnumbered. Of course, they had to go along with it without putting up a fight. Or the, yeah, we have to accept the incrementalism and the baby steps and the half measures and the the solutions that don't even come anywhere close to solving the real problem. And then later down the road at some undefined time, when we have more allies in Congress, then that's when we'll get the big stuff. That's when we'll really fight and and draw a line and put our foot down and, and really fight for the big stuff like UBI and Medicare for All. Or my favorite, yeah, they technically didn't get you anything. You got crumbs and scraps and a bunch of half measures and baby steps. But you should be grateful because it could have been worse. Guys, doesn't compel me or else I'd be uh, uh, vote blue no matter who support the Democratic Party because you could make that argument about them and the Republicans. So just being slightly better than shitty does not work for me. The incrementalism does not work for me. But that is what these elected progressives are trying to. That's the direction they're trying to steer this movement in. So I have two stories that have to do with foreign policy that further proves how we've been had by these uh, frauds who are the elected progressives. So there was a lot of uh, fanfare and excitement when a couple of the elected progressives in the House and in the Senate wrote a letter to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, threatening to condition aid to Israel if they uh, continued with with their planned annexation of, of Palestinian territory in the West Bank. And of course, this stirred up a whole bunch of, of hoobla and controversy. The the usual suspects uh, came out with their hair on fire, APAC, all their tools that they have in Congress, the mainstream media all came out and feigned outrage and, you know, the usual cries of anti-Semitism and, and all the nonsense. That was as expected. And then you have the lefties uh, online and in new media coming out and defending these elected progressives and pretending like this is such a big, bold stance that they took to condition aid if they, uh, uh, if Israel does more illegal land grabs. And I'm just sitting back looking at all of this like the theater that it is. Because if you just take a step back for a minute and look at the implications of that letter, of this this move by elected progressives, what they're saying is, technically, if you annex this territory that, that, they're, that they were broadcasting this week, if you do that... Then you cross a line and we will no longer support aid to Israel. But what that's implying is that if they don't do that, you'll, you'll, you'll just be just you'll be just fine with Israel getting three point eight billion dollars in aid from the U.S. government, which is fucking bonkers. That is a deranged position for anybody to take. The only position that makes sense for anybody on the left who claims to care about human rights and Palestinian rights is Israel shouldn't be getting any aid at all, period, end of discussion. That's it and that's all, like Nina Turner would say. They are currently conducting a genocide. That's what this is. The the whole situation with with Israel and Palestine or Israel and and Palestinians, that is a genocide. By the UN's de- uh, definition, by dictionary definitions, that is a genocide. So, under no circumstances is it okay for us to be giving them billions of dollars to buy weapons 
to, and, and military equipment and whatever nonsense to facilitate a genocide. So why aren't they actually pushing for that right now? Why isn't that their position right now? Cut off the aid, period, full stop, no end of discussion. Just cut off the aid. Because there is no better time, there has been no better time in history to do that, to make that argument and be 100% correct than right now. I mean, the year is 2020. Israel has shown for decades that no matter what they say, no matter what uh, uh, we ask them to do, no matter what the UN asks them to do, they're going to continue to violate the human rights of Palestinians. They're going to continue this ongoing genocide regardless. We could talk about all the annexations and land, land grabs that have gone on since the 60s and, and after that, or we could talk about Israel's 20, 2014 massacre in Gaza in the West Bank, where they killed 80% civilians with weapons that we gave them. We can talk about how at the same time, they bombed the only uh, uh, power plants in, in, in the West Bank and in Gaza. So, and then ever since then, it's been a humanitarian catastrophe. They're at best in certain areas, they have electricity for about four or three hours a day. Mind you, this is in the middle of the fucking desert. So they can't even have proper food storage without electricity. They can't have proper, proper water treatment and sewage without electricity. Their hospitals, their schools can't function properly. Uh, the economy has is, is been devastated from this and the, the open air prison that Gaza has. You, if you're in Palestinian territory, targeted assassinations and disappearances of Palestinians, uh, who criticize the Israeli government. You have the violence that we saw from the, the, at the Great March of Return, where Palestinians were peacefully protesting their occupation by the Israeli government. And in response, the IDF was shooting journalists, unarmed protesters, medics, all of them with impunity. So on the human rights front, there is absolutely no argument to be made that Israel should be getting any money from the U.S. government, much less $3.8 billion. But on top of that, with the current situation that we're in, with a, a pandemic ripping through the country worse than any part of the world, any part of the world, over 150,000 people dead, that's the very, that's a bare bottom estimate. It could be multiple times higher than that. Millions of people infected, millions of more going to be infected. Body count going to be, I, I don't even know. By the end of this, we have we don't have a functioning healthcare system. Tens of millions of people are losing the health insurance that they had on top of the millions of people who didn't have it before. Millions of people unemployed, at least 45 million people unemployed. Worst economic crisis in history. Our government response has been a joke and it's been nothing but a giant bailout to corporations. Trillion dollar bailout to corporations and the crumbs that they gave to the American people were the cheese in the trap. And we're giving, and instead of focusing all of our energy and, and resources into dealing with the crises that we are dealing with here in this country, we're going to send $3.8 billion to Israel, a country with a way better functioning healthcare system than we do. Have single, they have single payer. Everybody in that country is covered with, uh, by healthcare. We're giving them $3.8 billion for them to do a genocide. That makes absolutely no sense. Why aren't we using that $3.8 billion to, I don't know, fund community health centers here in the US or for testing or for protective equipment or any number of things? There is no way you can prioritize any rational person, same person will prioritize giving $3.8 billion over any of those things. So why aren't the progressives position? Why, aren't, why isn't the, their position completely cut off that aid to Israel and reallocate it to, to programs that need funding here in the U.S. I have no idea. But instead, they're going to take this grandstanding position and pretend like they're actually um, doing something when they're not. And it leads me to this other story that's also uh, related to foreign policy. And it also shows the incrementalism that we're getting from uh, a lot of these people who can claim to be representing the left in Congress. So apparently there's a move now um, 
progressives, they're trying to, quote, flex their muscles in Congress and in the Senate. And they're making this push to cut, watch this, cut 10% from the Pentagon budget. The Pentagon budget that has increased hundreds of billions of dollars since Donald Trump came into office. It is way beyond anything that is possibly excusable or rational more than the 10 next biggest militaries combined. And not to mention we're using this this money to fund endless war and genocide for profit and uh, human rights violations. And the response from the left, the response from the, the, the progressives in Congress is, all right, let's just cut that money 10%. Again, when you have a better argument than ever in any time in history to really slash the Pentagon budget because that money is desperately needed here in the United States. And that's this is their opening salvo, a 10% cut. So watch Kyle Klinsky talk about this uh, in a video that he did on his channel, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Now, I'd argue even that's not enough, okay? But 25% is the bare minimum Bernie and the progressives are calling for a 10% cut. Guys, just so you know, this last military budget, the spending was increased by $100 billion. So Bernie's cuts are to cut $74 billion. That's less than what we just had as the increase in the military budget this year. That's nothing. That's peanuts. See, this goes to show the problem with the Overton window. It keeps creeping further and further and further and further right. To the point where, listen, Bernie appears to be getting progressively more progressively, more and more conservative. This is not something... Uh, Ten years ago, five years ago, he wouldn't have said 10%. He would have said at least 25%. Why are you doing just 10%? And you know that it was just $100 billion added to the military budget. Sorry, I love Bernie, but I gotta hold him accountable here. This isn't nearly enough, bro. <laughs> like, come on. And it's not... It's not even like you have a borderline argument. Like, if you told me 20%, I could see the counter-arguments of like, okay, maybe the reason why they're doing 20 and not 40 or 50 and not even 25 is because 20 is a decent amount, but it's also politically possible to get somewhere. No, none of these are getting anywhere. So since none of them are getting anywhere, why would you not say 50%, 40%, minimum 25%? So there is no reason why you should cut it that little, especially when it was just increased by $100 billion. Now you want to cut it by $74 billion. You're not even getting rid of what the freaking increase was. It's just, it appears like he's getting more and more conservative between this and his vote on the CARES Act. Like why, it, it, this is, I don't think Bernie of 10 years ago or 20 years ago would have done this. I think Bernie of 10 years ago or 20 years ago would have said at least 25% cut. And I think Bernie of 10 or 20 years ago would have voted against the CARES Act because the CARES Act was nothing but a giant giveaway to the wealthy with absolute crumbs for for regular people. And, you know, I think the comparable vote back in 2009 was the Wall Street bailout. And he voted no on that. All right, so let's talk about the, the first part. The first, the, I can't speak. Let's talk about the first point that Kyle makes in this, uh, in this clip, which is just over the last year, the Pentagon budget's increased by about $100 billion. And for this next budget, the elected progressives think it's such a, a big, radical, lefty stance. A net increase of about $25 billion from the budget back in 2018. I'm, I'm almost at a loss of words. I don't know what to say about this. This is, this is the incrementalism that I was talking about. This is the Obama-style incrementalism. Oh, man, I really wish I can do all these great lefty policies, but we're just so outnumbered. We're so outnumbered. So I'm going to propose to do something that is a fairly conservative, centrist, right-wing policy, which is to give the, the Pentagon, the military, the national security apparatus, $700 billion. Hopefully we can get that instead of an $800 billion Pentagon budget. And this gets to a point that I've been making repeatedly on this show. The problem isn't that progressives and left just don't have enough numbers in Congress. We saw how the Tea Party with about 20 representatives in Congress sh completely shook up the dynamics and radically changed the discourse to the right and the policies that the, that was pursued to the right. And it was with a, a, a handful of representatives. 
So the problem isn't the numbers. The problem isn't that they are so much more outnumbered than the rest by the rest of Congress. The problem is that they do not actually put up anything that is remotely close to a real fight. Cutting 10% of the budget, proposing your opening salvo to the disgusting, bloated, entirely corrupt, 700, almost $800 billion Pentagon budget is to cut it by 10%, you aren't actually making a real demand. You're begging that they just don't increase the military budget. But you're asking them to keep it the same way. You're asking them to, to throw billions of dollars into doing a genocide in Yemen, the worst humanitarian crisis on the planet. You're saying it is just fine with me. It's okay if we continue to fund ISIS and Al-Qaeda and jihadists their money so that they can continue to rip apart Syria and the rest of the Middle East. You're saying that I'm just fine with billions of dollars being funneled into these giant money pit and endless wars that are going on in Iraq and Afghanistan that have been going on since 2001 and 2003, the longest wars in U.S. history. I'm cool with it, but let's just not go overboard and, and, and give the Pentagon $800 billion. Come on now, guys. Let's, be, let's, let's get real here. I mean, that's not a fight. That's not a fight. I don't care how you want to look at it. I don't, I don't care what excuse you want to make, what rationalization you want to make about um, them being outnumbered or... They're just trying to get small wins, and then they're going to keep adding up, and then eventually some undefined date in the future, then they'll get big wins. I don't care whatever reason and rationale you want to put on it. That's not a real fight. The last point he makes is really should not be controversial at this point at all, which is Bernie Sanders has gotten even more and more conservative the longer he's been in Congress. Between... uh proposing 10% cuts to the military budget and voting for the trillions of dollars to corporations and the richest people in this country, um, breaking his back and doing everything in his power to elect someone who continues to promise to veto Medicare for all while we're in the middle of a deadly pandemic. You take all that into account, plus the subservience to the leadership of the Democratic Party, the, the very same establishment that he he uh, pretends to rail against. I mean, it's clear Bernie Sanders is not a revolutionary. He's not leading a, a populist uprising anymore. That's That's done and over with. And really, if we're being honest and we're not putting too much weight into Twitter rhetoric and all the late night talk shows that he's doing with all he, his special guests where he talks about all the great policies we should have. If you, if we're just judging Bernie from his actions and the policy positions that he supported and the votes that he's taking recently, it's hard to distinguish him from the rest of the corporate Democrats, if I'm being completely honest at this point. And of course, it's not me saying he's as bad as Chuck Schumer or he's as bad as um, Joe Manchin, but he's not that much better. He's at the, at the end of the day, he's going to vote for uh, multi-trillion dollar corporate bailout scams, just like the rest of the corporate de Democrats. At the end of the day, he's going to break his back and tell you why it's so great to elect somebody who wants to veto Medicare for all in the middle of a pandemic, just like the rest of the corporate Democrats. So it is what it is with Bernie. He's just not the flaming lefty that he portrayed himself as and that many people thought he was. And then one last point about all the, the, the incrementalism, the Obama-style incrementalism that we're getting from the rest of these elected progressives in Congress. If you can't use the unprecedented leverage and opportunity that this moment presents between the pandemic, the economic crisis, um, historic unemployment, people, bodies in the streets for weeks at this point, if you can, and if you call yourself a populist, an economic populist, and you can use all this leverage to your advantage to get some major policy wins, then you're never going to get it. If at this late day 2020, all that's going on, pandemic, millions of people uninsured, about 20 between anywhere between 10 and, and 20 percent of the entire population has absolutely no insurance and that number is going up by the millions every week if all this is going on 
And like I said, you couldn't be an economic populist. You can't claim to be a, a lefty elected progressive in Congress. And when it comes time to propose any healthcare policies to deal with the moment, you go along and vote w- with the rest of the corporate Democrats to put uh, uh, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars to prop up for-profit uh, uh, corporate hospital corporations and to prop up uh, unaffordable co- COBRA insurance, which is just a, a scam to rip off people who lost their jobs and lost their health insurance. If you're going to vote along to prop that up, and you're not going to make the case for Medicare for all. You're not going to uh, draw a line in the sand and fight for Medicare for all now. When you, like I said, you have more leverage than any time in history. Then you're just not going to do it. And all of this talk about, oh no, we're just going to, we have to do it right now because it's an emergency and we have to help people do whatever we can to help people right now. But later, later, we'll get it all later. That's a bunch of hot air and it's incrementalism. And you're just going to kick the can down the road and hope that. Your promise is to get some real big policy wins at some undefined date in the future is enough to pacify the left. If at this late date 2020, all that's going on, historic economic crisis, and the only economic relief that Congress is giving to millions and millions of desperate people in this country is a couple hundred dollars, and your counter isn't, hell no, I'm not going along with this. I'm going to fight this tooth and nail. And I'm not settling for anything less than UBI. If that's not your position and you're going to go along and tell people, oh, no, trust me. We we're, we know this is terrible. We know this is shit. But it's an emergency. People need the money right now. We got to help people right now. So we'll vote for this. This this half, st- not even a half step. This, this incrementalism, this baby step. We'll vote for it to help some people. And we'll vote for a couple more shitty uh, uh, milk toast uh, stimulus. And But we'll, we'll get the UBI at some point down the road, later on, later, later, a couple years, five years, ten years, some point, when we have a progressive, have a supermajority, then we'll get the, the UBI. But until then, just get off our backs and be grateful for what we give you. Like I said, if you can't use the unprecedented leverage of this moment to make some headway or to get real policy, major policy wins, then you're never, ever going to fight to get those policy wins. Because this might... Like everybody, like a lot of people on the left have been saying, this moment is made for the populist, the economic populist. This moment is made for people like AOC and Bernie Sanders and Ilhan Omar and Elizabeth Warren and all Rokhan or Tulsi Abbott, all these people who claim to be working on behalf of the working class. This moment is made for you, and you have no better time to exercise your power. You have no more leverage than you do at this moment or at the big at the beginning of this crisis. And you've shown your, your hand. You've shown that you're not actually, re, you don't really have the backbone and the fortitude to take on the Democratic establishment to get those policies. So this is where we are. We're getting a bunch of, of Obama-style incrementalism from the so-called radical revolutionaries uh, representing the, the social Democratic left of the Democratic Party.